Hello and welcome. I'm Sarah and today I'm going to be talking about sulphate and I've also got biochemist Glyn Wainwright who's going to tell you a little bit about the importance of sulphate in healthy blood flow. Because sulphate or sulphur chemistry is something that isn't so well understood, I've included a little video in the beginning just to get the main points about the importance of sulphur and sulphate in the diet. I've tried to keep it simple for the non-chemists and biochemists, but again, any questions, please ask in the description. Sulphur is found in abundance in the Earth's crust, and sulphur is an essential element in the human body, and it makes up about 0.25% of our weight. Sulphur is essential for all life, as it participates in many chemical reactions, and also it helps to hold molecules together structurally. So this can be very small things like proteins, all the way up to large structures like ligaments, tendons, and connective tissue. Biologically, sulphur is usually in its organosulfur form or in its reduced or oxidized forms. Sulphur exhibits oxidation numbers of minus 2, 0, plus 2, plus 4, plus 6. And these would be compound, or these would be forms such as sulfane, sulfate, sulfide, and sulfite. So it might be something that you've come across before. The biological form that is most commonly used in the body is sulfate, and sulfate is what Glyn is going to be talking about later. As you can see from the schematic, it has four oxygens and sulfate is negatively charged with the chemical formula SO4 2 minus. Where do we get sulphur from? You can get sulphur from water, mineral water, and different mineral waters and tap waters will contain different amounts of sulphate. Amino acids which contain sulphur, for example, methionine, cysteine, and taurine, dietary glutathione and dietary sulfated glycosaminoglycans, organosulfur compounds such as sulfurophanes, which are found in broccoli. Brussels sprouts and cabbage and those kind of vegetables. And also thiosulfonates, which an example would be allicin found in, in garlic. Vitamins B7 and B1 contain sulfur. And supplements such as MSM, methyl sulfonyl methane. And people take this supplement to help with arthritis, pain and such like. And generally the supplement is produced in a laboratory but small amounts of MSM are found in certain plants and some parts of certain animals. So examples of sulphate in the body. With respect to connective tissue, many people have heard of chondritin sulphate because along with glucosamine sulphate, it's something people take to help with joint pain, ligaments and cartilage. Also, keratin sulfate is involved in connective tissue, but it's more the looser type of connective tissue, but often comes together with chondritin. Heparin sulfate is found on the cell surface of most cells, and dermatan sulfate is found in veins, arteries, skin, and also in heart valves, so it has cardiovascular importance. During detoxification in the liver, in phase two, enzymes add sulfur groups to compounds to make them more water soluble and less reactive, meaning they're easier to excrete. These kind of compounds would be phenols, amines, food dyes and other toxic substances. So that means people with impaired sulfate metabolism or deficiencies in sulfur or sulfate are going to have trouble removing certain compounds or toxins from their bodies. It has been found that some patients with autism have impaired sulfate metabolism, which would mean that they're more sensitive to certain toxins. With respect to transport in the body, sulfate is something called a cosmotrope, which means it's an order maker, and very, very briefly it creates and organises water into structures around itself, almost like a gel. This is a very big bio biophysical topic, and it's something I'll come back to in future videos as this relates to exclusion zone water and the hydrophobic effect. There are also sulfated hormones and compounds such as vitamin D sulfate, DHEA sulfate, dopamine sulfate, tyrosine sulfate, sulfolipids. And when these particular molecules or hormones become sulfated, it changes 
their properties. So they function differently in the body than the versions that people are more familiar with. I'll come back to what these particular sulfated versions do in a later video. Cholesterol sulfate is what we're going to be talking about shortly. And cholesterol itself is not water soluble. And so therefore it's hydrophobic, meaning it's water hating. And it needs to be transported around the body in lipoproteins such as LDL and HDL, along with other lipids. Cholesterol sulfate, however, is special. It's amphiphilic, meaning it's both hydrophilic and hydrophobic. So it has a water hating end and a water loving end. And cholesterol sulfate is found on the surface of red blood cells. Have you got any more time to just talk about one more interesting thing, okay. um, another molecule? Because people who've heard of Stephanie Seneff will know that she's very interested in sulfate, vitamin D, um, glyphosate. Oh, yes. Um, so what would you like to say, I think, about, about sulfate? Because that's the one... There was a wonderful moment from Stephanie when she said, OK, we've, we know cholesterol's a good guy. She said, um, when we've done our bits on sugar, we know sugar was the bad guy. She said, but there's another molecule that's bugging me. She said, I'm really interested in, she said, cholesterol sulfate. What's that all about, she said. And that was the start of an amazing adventure because it took us into the realms of sulfur chemistry. Now, before the Earth had an oxygen atmosphere, the life that existed on Earth at that time, like the stuff at volcanic vents, runs on sulfur, sulfur respirations. So, and we didn't know what we were getting into with this sulfate business. But uh, we came up with a radical hypothesis about the role of cholesterol sulfate in red blood cells. We noticed that red blood cells were absorbing sulfide, which was available in the, coming back from the organs in the bloodstream. We also noticed that they were bristling with cholesterol sulfate. And so we started to wonder what was going on here. Um, we found that in going from sulfide to sulfate, you actually attach more oxygen to the sulfur, and you actually put energy in. There's more energy in, in the sulfate than there is in the sulfide. So if you can reverse that process, you release oxygen and you release energy. That seemed like a useful thing to do. And then we thought, well, why? Why are we seeing cholesterol sulfate? Where's it coming from? Uh, if the oxygen, there's oxygen available in a red blood cell, there's uh, energy uh, available in the form of glucose, and there's a few other things inside red blood cells. Red cell cells are generally regarded as boring, but from a chemical point of view, they're fascinating because you've got enzymes in there. And there was one enzyme in there that particularly intrigued Stephanie, and it was endothelial nitrous oxide synthase. Oh, ENOS. ENOS. Yeah. Now, Stephanie said NO, which it makes, the nitrous oxide molecule, is toxic to red blood cells. So why would a red blood cell carry an enzyme that makes something which is toxic to the red blood cell? And we thought about this for a while, and she said, maybe, maybe we've given it the wrong name. Maybe in the context of the red blood cell, it's not ENOS. Yeah. Maybe it's ESOS. Mm -hmm. So we started to look to see whether this enzyme had the potential to oxidize sulfur. And sure enough, it has. So you've got oxygen, Sulfur, sulfide in the bloodstream, going into the red blood cell, and you've got the ability to make sulfate. So what happens to the sulfate then? Well, there's another enzyme in the red blood cell called uh, a sulfonation. And it's, it's this enzyme, there are quite a few of them in the body, but this, this one will attach sulfate to a cholesterol molecule. And the interesting thing about what happens then is that when it finds its way, the cholesterol is in the lipid layer, and it tends to pop out, you know, when you, pop, when you put sulfate onto the end of a cholesterol molecule, it sticks out of the layer. So you've got a layer of fat on the outside of the cell, you've got these little sulfates popping out. Now sulfates, if they pop out of other cells, mean that there's a negative charge. 
sulfate carries a negative charge on it. And so the, the red blood cells now have negative charges all over them, which stops them coming together and sticky. But don't, doesn't the glycocalyx inside the blood vessels have... Same them? happens on the blood vessel wall, that's right. So you've got these sulfide, sulfates there. And um, So it's crucial for smooth blood flow. So, so first thing is it's yeah. slick. Oh, yeah. it, it's, it really helps things to not stick and keep flowing. The artery and the vein are at different electrical potentials. Okay. There's a voltage difference between an artery and a vein. And the vein is more positively charged than an artery. There's a negative positive. So the blood vessel, the blood sulfate is attracted, being negative, is attracted to the positive end of this tube. So it's almost like as though there's an electrostatic force pushing it through. And when you watch them go down capillaries in micrographs, uh, uh, films, you know, you can see that they really do slick. They're slick and they flow. And their job is to distribute oxygen. So we started to wonder about oxygen in red blood cells. So there's this oxygen perfusion thing. Mm -hmm. Now it's a puzzle for me. Uh, how does oxygen get from the lungs through the bloodstream, carried on red blood cells, into a, a neuron or a muscle? find its way to the mitochondria where it's available to burn sugar mm -hmm. without burning everything in sight on the way from A to B. Yeah. You know, so, so oxygen is pretty reactive, so it needs a safe escort. So we started to wonder if the sulfate, being stable in this environment, mm -hmm. was a way in which the perfusion of oxygen from the lungs through the system right through to the, uh, the cell that required oxygen for burning was, was a way that it could be safely escorted. So we've raised a, a hypothesis paper in, in molecular biology. So well, that would be the cholesterol sulfate inside the membrane yeah. to help chaperone the oxygen in so it can get into the mitochondria. Without so we causing can, damage on the way Without burning through. everything all the way through. How did it get what well, well, form well, does the oxygen travel another, another molecule yeah. we were looking for, which was capable of almost rolling around on the outside of the cell to yeah. transfer the sulfate across. What form would the oxygen be in when it's being transported? Sulfate. Okay. Oh, as a sulfate. As a okay. Sulfate. So, oh, okay, I get so it you, 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 so just what, you do, have, yeah. what you do is you pack energy and oxygen into a sulfide and convert it to sulfate, the N4P, the thermodynamics is right for this. Yeah. Because I, I had my schoolboy head on at the time. I thought, hang on, you burn sulfur, it gives off heat. Yes. This can't be right. But of course, we weren't starting from sulfur, we were starting from sulfide. And when you go from sulfide to sulfate, the energy's the other way around. Yeah. We didn't find that out until we started looking at. Um, biology papers about sewage works published in the 1930s. And yes. <laughs> which is, the, you know, the adventures on sulfur were fantastic. Um, so we got this amazing, what we think is possibly a, a vestigial sulfur metabolism going on inside us to safely escort oxygen around the body. This is by no means proven. No. This is a speculative thing, but it's the way you know, every time we go looking for the next player in the line, he, yes. it, it turns up. And, and it would be wonderful if we could have an alternative explanation of how oxygen gets through the body. Perfusion is the name that they give it. They can all measure it, they all tell you, oh, it's perfusion, it's reperfusion, this, that, and the other. But the assumption is that all the molecular oxygen somehow is, is going through all these processes without burning anything. And, yes. and, and that, to me, as a chemist, just don't stack up. Because also, people, like chemically, oxygen, you've got there, lots of free radicals are oxygen. Yes, um, yeah, I mean, species. we go through a lot of trouble to control exactly. oxidative species in the body. I mean, the mitochondria is all about oxidation control. I mean, that's, that's another problem with the statins. The statins, uh, as, as well as shutting down cholesterol production, shut down something called coenzyme Q10 mm -hmm. and dolicols. Coenzyme Q10 is an important antioxidant mechanism inside the mitochondria. It keeps the mitochondria in order 
stops it being corrupted by oxidation processes going on. And the mitochondria is the battery part of the cell. It's, it's where the energy, it's where the sugar is burnt to make carbon dioxide and water. And the ATP is released from the mitochondria. And you need to control the oxidation going on in there. And that's, you know, that's, that's the furnace of the cell. It's like a fuel if, emission, isn't it? When you've yeah. got a really old, inefficient car, it uses loads of petrol, yeah. produces lots of noise and smell. You it doesn't don't want do much. all these processes going on in there, leaking out into the cell yeah. and causing havoc. So you've got to control these chemicals on their way to and from their destinations and make sure they get there. It's such a clever... Oh, I know. I love the idea of sulfate. So how could somebody not get enough sulfate in their diet and how could somebody introduce more sulfate? There are no standards for sulfate in, in nutrition. Um, so this is a whole new territory. It could be a whole new player in Difficult to avoid sulfur in food. I mean, okay. a, a one big tip is if it goes off easily and smells, yeah. it's probably got sulfur in it. What, like eggs, eggs. and bro uh, Brussels sprouts? Brussels sprouts. Um, and the garlic, you know. Oh, because garlic's yeah. known to have cardiovascular benefits, well, so people aren't exactly sure why. If, if sulfate is this important in, in the functioning of the cardiovascular system, then it's likely that sulfate, the sulfur foods are going to keep it in tip-top condition. If you were deficient in sulfur, things are going to start getting sticky. Yeah. You know, not enough non-stick covering for your cells. And also doesn't the um, lack of sulfur sort of dry people out? It's part of as you get older and you have less sulfate that it yeah. sort of dries you out. Well, you know, you know the, there are a lot of things that start failing as you get older. <laughs> um, and uh, sulfate is probably one of them. Also, sulfate is used to detoxify the body. You know, if, if your liver has to get rid of some xenobiotics mm -hmm. and toxins, if you like, some things that yeah. shouldn't be there, its favourite trick is to oxidise them and attach a sulphate to them, make them water soluble, then the kidneys can pick them up and weigh them away. So, you know, that's the way most toxins leave the body, get turned into sulphates. Is that why San Pellegrino uh, mineral water is more expensive than everything else? Because it's got a huge so. amount of sulphate in it. Yeah, I mean, Stephanie also uh, led some research we looked up on the effect of sulfur in vaccines, in sulfates and, and vaccine, we found that there was, we were looking at um, syndromes where there were people took, if you take paracetamol for example, mm -hmm. if your kid gets vaccinated and you take paracetamol, then that paracetamol is going to get oxidized and weed away as a sulfate product. Mm -hmm. So there's going to be a loss of sulfate from the body. So you really need to give children sulfur rich foods, you know, to put that back. Maybe. And there's a, there's a, an issue with autism as well we've been looking at. We could, a whole variety of, of, of issues to do with sulfur depletion, possibly. Okay. Unfortunately, that's all we have time for today. But Glyn and I will be back again soon talking about biochemistry. But in the meantime, thank you very much for watching and goodbye.